introduce this notion of improvisation as spiritual practice. And we've got to start with this word spirituality. It's kind of a tricky beast. Uh, and I, I think of it kind of like a chameleon. It really depends how what the word means. To, what the word means depends on your back, on the background you're looking at it, right? It depends on your own eyes. It shifts around a lot. And some would say we shouldn't really even try to dissect it, that doing so damages it. If you go to the I Ching, the great book of Chinese wisdom, it says the Tao that can be named is not the real Tao. So there may be truth in that, uh, but I also think there's value in taking a stab at words that matter to us. And uh, I think this might matter to us, but some of us might have resist resistance to it. So I want to start by saying I don't think of spirituality as the same thing as religion. The, the root of the word religion, religio, means to tie back or to bind. To tie back or to bind. So you might think of religion as like a shared set of beliefs, practices, rituals that tie us back from the things we don't want and tie us to the things we do want. And so, yeah, you can see that there's some danger in that, right? I mean, we get constriction with religion. We get division with religion sometimes. But we also get support for life's up and downs, and we're, we're connected to something, a network that matters and, and allows us to cope with difficulty. But I want to submit that spirituality is something different, that it's a, a personal experience, uh, it's a fluid experience, it's a lived experience. So that's what we'll explore a little bit of this morning. And I want to start with a story. This is a picture of me and my siblings. I'm on the right. It's my brother David and my sister Jennifer, and this was when I was about... 13 years old, uh, just about the time that I went to visit a woman named Carol Glover. Carol was a woman who came to live with us when my parents got divorced when I was five, and she became a great friend and like a second mother to me. And I went down to North Carolina to visit her, partly because I hadn't seen her in a while, but also because I was a fan of North Carolina basketball. That was when Michael Jordan was playing there. But I took my first flight alone to North Carolina. And when I was there, she told me a story uh, that she hadn't told anybody else. And it was one that really affected me and my own understanding of spirituality. Carol uh, was with her friend Terry, and they had just seen a concert in Providence, Rhode Island. Actually, the village people. <laughs> and earlier I had a slide of the village people, but I thought that'd be a little too much. Okay. They saw the village people in Providence, Rhode Island, and they went, uh, were driving to Keene, New Hampshire, and so it was late at night. They were both tired, and Carol turned to Terry and said, hey, are you okay to drive? I know you're tired. And Terry said, yeah, I'm fine. And Carol said, okay, let me know if you need me to take over. I'm glad to do it. So Carol fell asleep, and she started dreaming, and who knows how long it was, really. In her dream, she got this sense of foreboding, that there was something really wrong. And then in her dream, she saw a hand on her shoulder and felt the hand on her shoulder and she looked at it and it was a strong hand and she had the sense that it was a caring hand. And that hand shook her so much in the dream that she woke up. And when she woke up, she looked ahead of her and saw that they were headed towards a boulder. She turned over to Terry and saw that Terry had fallen asleep. So she quickly yelled to Terry, Terry, wake up! Terry woke up, slammed on the brakes and they came within inches of the boulder. I heard that story and was stunned. I'm, I still get chills to tell it. And it wasn't just that. It was that that night when she went home, you know, they sort of gathered themselves and dealt with the adrenaline, made the trip back home. Carol took out a piece of paper and a pencil and drew the hand that she had seen. And she would be the first to tell you that she's not an artist. Uh, and yet this hand, and I hope that you can see it, is one that I, th when I saw it, I thought the detail uh, and the vitality of this drawing came through the page as if it were animated by something else. Both pieces of this story, the, the experience in the car and the drawing of the hand, spoke to me of what is this mysterious thing that keeps us alive? What is it? I, is it God? Is it light? Is it life? Is it love? Is it... I don't know. I don't have a name for it, but it's something. And cool! And that's about it, right? Uh, and so this is my, my own understanding of spirituality come, speaks to and from this perspective. 
And so I want to put this forward as a working definition of spirituality. That it's the whole person practice of awakening, feeling, and expressing a connection to larger mystery. By whole person, I mean the chosen parts of us and the given parts of us. I mean the parts of us that we like and the parts of us that we don't like, the savory and the unsavory, all of it. By practice, I mean it's a something intentional that we commit to, like a religious practice or like a practice for performance. We come back to it again and again for improvement. Awakening, I'm suggesting that maybe there's a part of us that is lying dormant. We don't know yet, but we're calling it, we're saying, hey, come on. They put that hand on the shoulder, wake up. That it's about feeling, it's about our mind, but also our body and our emotions. It's our whole person. And it's about expressing it, giving voice to whatever it is we find, the joy, the despair, the excitement, the confusion. And again, that we're connecting to this something larger, this unnameable thing. The whole person practice of awakening, feeling, and expressing a connection to larger mystery. So again, we could choose a different definition. This is the one I'm going with today for our sake, right? So then you say, all right, <laughs> but how is improvisation a spiritual path? And I know uh, I've got a bunch of you are already going there and probably already have. I know many of you already do. But I want to put forward at least seven ways that we could consider improvisation a spiritual path. The first is that we're exercising an ethic. If you take any beginning improvisational theater class, and I imagine in any of your applied improv experiences, we have all these principles. Slow down, simplify, connect with your partner, be ready for change. These are principles that help, make us, help us build better scenes and they help us build better lives as well. So we get this uh, set of guidelines and principles that can keep us walking a path where we become good human beings. We become good to each other. We become at peace moving through the world. The Hindus have uh, believe that the world was created through Leela, or divine play. Uh, and any improv scene, no matter how poignant or uh, disturbing, has an element of this like, okay, what do we got? What's coming? And I would submit that this is an attitude about life that helps us live a vibrant, joyous life as well. When we're in improv and we're dancing around with this stuff with each other, we're engaging this part of ourselves that is connected to that fundamental mystery. You'll hear me talk about this one a lot, uh, if you know me in other circles. Mindfulness is the practice of paying attention on purpose to the present moment with curiosity and kindness. Paying attention to the present moment on purpose with curiosity and kindness. That's one definition. Again, improv trains us in this. In order to be a good improviser, one needs to develop this kind of awareness and attention and open-heartedness. When we do this in our real lives, colors become clearer, feelings become deeper, tastes become richer. We expand to more of who we are and what we can be. Many religious traditions talk about interdependence. In Islam, you'll hear about unity. In Buddhism, you'll hear about interbeing. If you turn to the world of science, you hear about ecology or mirror neurons. There is a fundamental truth that we are interconnected with each other and with all things. And improv is like, puts us in this nest of interconnectedness that says, go, experience it. Right? I make an offer, I am affected. Someone else makes an offer, they are affected. Anything affects everything else that's happening in that moment. This image is of Indra's net, the, an image from Hinduism, of a net that covers the whole universe and at every node of the net is a bead that reflects every other bead. So at any point in the net of the universe, you can find everything else. We are stitched together. Carl Jung described the shadow as the part of ourselves that we have hidden or disowned. We don't want to admit. And if we always deny it, it becomes dangerous. It can leak out through projection or rupture 
and cause great damage. If we integrate it, it becomes a source of power and depth and humor and peace. Improv gives us a chance, again, to face this and play with it in a way that is real, but less risky. Right? We get to play the, the, <laughs> the nasty character. My buddy, Lisa, who's a great improv teacher, Lisa Rowland, was working with me and she said, you know, you're really good at playing the nice, generous character. I'm really good at that. She said, how about playing the nasty guy? How about playing the villain? So this has been like a three-year project since she gave me that note. I'm still working on it. But I did get to play some villains a few weeks ago, and it was actually quite refreshing. <laughs> Integrating my shadow. <laughs> the world is paradoxical. When we look at that mystery, we find paradox. Uh, you could say, how is there a loving God in so much suffering? How can we be this tiny speck in a universe and matter have this sense of inherent worth that we do? How does that make sense? We, is one of those things true or is the other? We face the same thing in improv. Should I push the scene forward or should I let my partner lead? Am I just being present in the moment or am I paying attention to the narrative arc of the story that has to unfold? Right? And of course the answer is yes and. We're doing both of those things, and maybe we're toggling back and forth so quickly that it just becomes one thing. Like a Merbia strip, you follow the trail around this, it's all one thing happening at the same time, and yet it's a paradox. And then I also want to mention that, of course, and this may be the most direct way that improvisation could be considered a spiritual path to me, is that it puts us in direct contact with inspiration. In any moment of creativity, when we get an idea, where is that thing coming from? Maybe it's a, a constellation of our experiences and our histories and our training, but okay, peel all that away, then where does it come from? We move too, you know these games and exercises or scene work, we move too quickly to do it logically. It's coming from somewhere else. And the word spontaneous, uh, the root of the word spontaneous is about making a conscious choice, a free will action. And in this case, I would say that spontaneity is putting our choosing with free will to be in the space of creativity, of not knowing. And so improv does this for us. So to come back and review these seven, improvisation is a spiritual practice. It allows us to exercise an ethic. It gives us a way of moving through the world. It invites us to dive into this divine play, that we're not just having a good time. We could be, but we're also connecting to something larger than us in it. it. Gives us a chance to practice mindfulness in an active, playful way. We celebrate and experience our interdependence directly. We have the chance to face the shadow, to engage paradox, and to open to inspiration. So I'd like to leave you with Four, uh, four pieces of an invitation. The first would be to wake up. <laughs> I hope maybe this talk, this little snippet of, of thought, can be like a hand on your shoulder. Not necessarily that you're hurtling towards danger, but that there is a possibility within improvisation for a part of ourselves to be activated that may have been lying dormant. It may have been sleeping. And it's really fun to step into this realm, if you choose to. The second invitation is to collaborate. I would love to work with you. I would love to hear your thoughts, even if you think this is complete lunacy. Tell me why, tell me how. Uh, I'm leading a couple workshops later today. Would love to see you. I'd love to work with you later at some other time. If you choose to step into this realm, I also encourage you to pay attention. There are little pieces, signposts, guide, guide Mm, angels that show up along the way that give you meaning. Seek them out. Play with them. See what they're trying to say. Pay careful attention. And lastly, with whatever you find, bring the rest of us along. We're just at the beginning of exploring this connection between improvisation and spiritual practice as a wider earth community. And 
I've been doing it for a few years. It is rich and wide open. It keeps getting wider and wider. Uh, so we've got a journey in front of us to have a lot of fun on. I hope that you'll join in. Thank you.